Good evening. I'm Max Taylor, co-president of ASMP DC, and this is Kaveh Sadari, the other co-president. We'd like to welcome you to the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the McAvoy Theater. Um, it's a real honor to have Mary Ellen Mark speak tonight, and we welcome you to the uh, theater. Um, as you know, uh, our chapter has been uh, a big part of Photo Week, and we've really enjoyed the partnership with uh, Theo and, and his crew, and we've had some really terrific programs uh, in the past few years. Um, it's nice being in this theater. We've uh, expanded the venue so we can include a lot more people, and uh, we'd like to thank the Smithsonian for their partnership with that. Um, we uh, would also like to thank Betsy Brown, the uh, director of the museum, and um, we'd also like to especially thank Gene Mopsick, the director of ASMP, for his support of Photo Week and our programs here tonight. Um, and for Photo Week, we'd really like to thank some of their sponsors, uh, the NEA, National Endowment for the Arts, Squarespace, and um, the PNC Bank. And with that, I'd like to bring on Cave for a few more remarks. Well, my part is really, really easy and quick. Uh, I just want to thank our board, um, the DC chapter of ASMP. Um, they do amazing work, and I'm just so proud of all of them and working with them through all these years. So if I can have, actually have an applause for the, our board, because <laughs> these, thank you. These programs, as you can imagine, take a lot of effort, and uh, we're all a uh, volunteer board, and uh, it's months and months in the making, and uh, we're just so happy that we could make this happen with the help of Theo and Photo Week. Um, I also um, want to ask everyone, if you're not following us on social media, please uh, go to, a to on Facebook, we're ASMPDC, and on Twitter as well, ASMPDC, and uh, we'd love to hear from you, connect with you. We have uh, programs once a month. Uh, in the evening, and then we have a, a new, um, not a new, but a, a morning program we also have once a month uh, that brings photographers together. And we just started a, uh, another program on uh, Tuesdays once a month. Uh, it's a happy hour for all of us to get together and have a little fun. <laughs> there we go. It's, it's called Beers and Cheers, right? So now I'm going to introduce uh, Lisa Hostetler, who's um, the McAvoy family curator of photography, who's going to uh, introduce our guest, Mary Ellen. Thank you very much for coming, and enjoy yourself. Thanks, Max and Kaveh, and thank you all for coming. Um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to echo um, the previous thanks to our sponsors. Um, and I want to extend my personal thanks to um, Max and his team, to Meredith Liu at Mary Ellen Mark's studio, and to Kaylin Le Pen and Nona Martin for organizing this evening's program. The Smithsonian American Art Museum is pleased to be partnering with the American Society of Media Photographers, DC chapter, and with Photo Week DC on this event, and we hope to collaborate on other photography-related activities in the future. In the meantime, I hope you'll take some time, if you haven't already, to see the two photography exhibitions that are on view here at the American Art Museum. Uh, the first is um, on the first floor. Uh, it's called A Democracy of Images, photographs from the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and it was curated by Mary Foresta to celebrate 30 years of the museum's photography program. And the other one is um, on the second floor on the F Street side. It's called Landscapes in Passing, photographs by Steve Fitch, Robert Flick, and Elaine Mays, um, which I organized. And it looks at America as seen from the road in the 1970s. Before going any further, um, there's two housekeeping issues I'd like to mention. Please just take a moment to silence your cell phone or any other potentially noisy devices you might have. Um, and also, we're recording this program, so at the end, um, during the question and answer session, if you could ask your questions from the microphone so that our virtual audience can hear it. Now to the main event, Mary Ellen Mark, whose distinctive photographs have gained her worldwide recognition as a major documentary photographer and photojournalist. She's published photo essays and portraits in such publications as Life, New York Times Magazine, the New Yorker, Rolling Stone, and Vanity Fair, among many others. Um, 
Her work has appeared in numerous museum and gallery exhibitions worldwide, and she's traveled extensively. Um, some of her best known subjects include Mother Teresa, Indian circuses, and Bombay brothels. Closer to home, she's well known for a photo essay on teenage runaways in Seattle, which became the basis for the Academy Award-nominated film Streetwise, directed by her husband Martin Bell and released in 1983. One of the best known um, characters from that project uh, is a woman called Teeny, um, and uh, she's continued to document um, her life for the past 30 years. Um, those photographs were my introduction to her work, and I've admired the penetrating humanism of her vision ever since. Uh, Ms. Mark has a long list of books to her credit, including Passport, Ward 81, Falkland Road, Mother Teresa's Mission of Charity in Calcutta, Streetwise, Indian Circus, Portraits, A Cry for Help, Twins, Exposure, Scene Behind the Scene, and Prom, and those are just some of them. Um, in the spring, a new body of work, Man and Beast, will be published by the University of Texas Press, and Aperture will re release an updated version of the Streetwise book in 2015. She's the recipient of a number of prestigious awards, including the Cornell Kappa Award from the International Center of Photography, the Infinity Award for Journalism, an Erna and Victor Hasselblad Foundation grant, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and three National Endowment for the Arts Fellowships. Her photographs are in major museum collections all over the world, from the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Centre Pompidou in Paris, among many, many, many others. We're thrilled to have her here with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Mary Ellen Mark. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Is this okay? <coughs> thank you so much. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, I want to thank the ASMP, uh, Max Taylor, and Kave. Did I pronounce it right? Kave. <laughs> Kave Sadai. And uh, the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, Lisa Hotz-Stetler, and Kaylin LaPen. Um, it's really wonderful to be in this wonderful museum, and um, I'm really honored. So I, I thought, I, I'm going to go through my work really quickly, because I want to show you three short films at the end. Um, and I, I tried to break it down um, in a way that made sense. So I hope it does. I'm going to first show you a book that I did about six years ago. It's like a retrospective book. Um, and here we go. It was called Exposure. And there are pictures that I did from the time I started photographing. And I started photographing when I was 23 years old. And uh, I had a Fulbright in 1965 to go to Turkey. And I traveled in Turkey. And it was my first experience of really going around the world or with a camera. So this is a man who won the mustache contest. And um, just traveling and taking pictures. I went to the Annenberg School for Communications at University of Pennsylvania, and at that time it was an art school. And they had Bruce Davidson there, who's a wonderful photographer, and he gave us each an assignment, and it was during Christmas, since my assignment was to photograph Santa Claus. That's Santa Claus on his lunch break. And I moved to New York in, in the mid-60s, and I started photographing events that were happening in, in the city traveled around, all around the city, went to Central Park, and I still I'm basically see myself as a street photographer because, for me, that's the best exercise to work. If you can work in the street and photograph, you can photograph anywhere or anything. This was on Broadway, you know, when it was interesting. <laughs> in, And at that time, in the 60s, it was during the Vietnam War, and so there were a lot of protesters for the war and against the war. It was very lively, and I would go out with a camera. And what was so different then, now when you go out on the street with a camera, and I still do, um, everyone has a camera. Everyone's a photographer. Everyone has a cell phone or a video camera, and people push and shove. It's very hard. At that time, there weren't so many people out on the streets. And I started doing assignments for magazines, and at that time, 
magazines really needed photographers and they needed documentary photographers. That, that sadly, that time is over. And one of my first assignments was for Ms. Magazine, and it was on Appalachian women. And I did all kinds of uh, stories, and, and on, I photographed, this was in Hayden Lake, Idaho, the uh, area nations, and, and then I started to work commercially for film companies. And I would photograph on film sets and take pictures, and my first assignment was on the Satyricon, photographing Federico Fellini, and it was a fantastic experience. And then I photographed Louis Bunuel on Tristana. And I took a, this was Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy in Los Angeles. And this was an assignment done in the 90s on um, old cowboys, and it was my idea. And, you know, when magazines flourished, you could actually bring an idea to a magazine and they would do it. And this, this was photographing old cowboys, and actually, he came to the door dressed like that. That's the Lone Ranger. <laughs> you know, I'm not very conceptual. I always, I kind of like to photograph people as they are in the real environment. He was very paranoid. <laughs> and there used to be the, this group of, called the Day in the Life Projects, and they, it was wonderful, actually, because a whole bunch of photographers would get together and they would fly us to Spain or um, China or wherever and we'd take pictures and you always got pictures for yourself and this was in Barcelona at a gypsy camp. And this was in, in uh, Torino and in a hospital. And this is one of my first assignments that I did. It was for Look magazine. It was on a hospital in, in London that was giving diminishing doses of heroin to drug addicts. And I teach in Oaxaca, and I've taught there for 20 years, but I've been going there for years. And this was taken in the 60s in Oaxaca, and it hasn't changed that much. This was in Chiapas, actually. And this is traveling uh, in the 70s with Peter Brooks uh, actors in, in Nigeria. And a story done for Life magazine on street children in cartoon. And another one of the Day in the Life type projects in China, in Mickey Mouse ears, boy with Mickey Mouse ears. And this was done a few years ago in northern Mexico. It's at a very strange festival, um, worshipping a, a, a very strange saint. But in order to get this picture, I had to go into that pit of dirt. And it was, I was terrified that they were going to you know, push me over because with my hassle blood, but they didn't. And this is in, in Ireland at a gypsy camp, the First Communion. And it was, a, it was a great time. There were so many things to photograph and so many places to go. And people that would assign you to go these places. This was in Kiev in, when, it, uh, when the former Soviet Union opened up. And, and uh, this was uh, a school for blind children. And I read an interview when I was coming down here today that I did in 1991. It was for a Smithsonian book, actually. It was on documentary photography. They did a series of these small books. And, and it made me so sad to read it because, you know, there was just one assignment after another. And, and it, it, was, it was an amazing time. I've had an amazing life, and I'm very grateful for it. But I'm very sad that there are no more magazines. This was in Ethiopia. Um, at a quorum, a quorum at a camp. I went to one place. I've always felt it's better to go to one place than to keep going back again and again. This is one of the first stories that I did. It was in India in the 60s. It was a, about young people that had gone to India. They'd run away or they'd run away actually. And they'd gone there for enlightenment and for drugs. And that was the first time I went to India. And that time someone took me to Falkland Road, which was the, the street where the least expensive prostitutes lived. And I swore I would go back one day. And I convinced a magazine to spend the money to send me back there. And I spent three months photographing prostitutes in Bombay. On Falkland Road. The name of the street was Falkland Road. 
And then the next year, I, I love circus, but this is sort of a circus story, but not really. India has street performers, and it's a tradition that's passed on from generation to generation. It's a snake charmer training his son. So I did a story on, on a street performers. It's a monkey, monkey trainer's daughter. And then Mother Teresa, um, when she won the Nobel Prize, John Lowen Gardner Life, uh, I convinced him to send me to Calcutta. And I did a story on the mis Missionaries of Charity, which is what her group is called. And then I came back the following year and did more pictures for a book that was published by Ansel Adams. Um, and I just spent time in Calcutta and photographed all of her mission houses there. And it was an in incredible time. Eventually, I have many, many pictures. I want to do, it was a tiny book, these, these untitled series that, uh, that Ansel Adams did. So I eventually want to put together a, a big book. I have so many pictures from the, I spent the, t the period of time I spent there. And just traveling in India, I traveled a lot in India. It's the man who loved his tree. And, and in Benares on the Burning Ghats. And it's always fascinated by the children who lived on the Burning Ghats, who lived right beside the Burning Ghats, because they lived there because their, their fathers worked there. And the circus, I love the circus. And from the first days in India, this was in the 60s, this picture, I would always ask when I went there, is there a circus in town? And then I would go and I would take pictures. And then finally, in the early 90s, I was able to put together a project where I spent six months in India and photographed 18 different circuses. That's Pinky. And that's Ram Prakash Singh and his elephant Shyama. And this picture has significance for me simply because right after I took this image, I went to shake his hand to thank him. And, and Mira, his beloved elephant, bit me. Elephant, sorry. Um, that's my hostility towards her. <laughs> Chimp. <laughs> she bit my hand. And then the next year I, I came back and he told me she'd forgiven me. I should go and shake her hand. So I went to the training. She was in a big training cage and I went up to it. And she, she, took, she looked at me, and then she took this very, went to the end of the cage and took this really strange position and charged me. And I, I pulled my arm out to just in time. So she hadn't forgiven me. <laughs> tricky. Chimps are very tricky. Their trainers are usually missing fingers. And that's Raja and Gloria. And I knew Raja since she was a baby, and, and uh, he was a baby, and he remembered me. And I think in a way, as with Falkland Road, being a woman, it, it gave me an access to the circus. It might have been more difficult for a man because the, the girls in India are hired by their families. So they pay, the, the, the trainers pay the families. So it's very much for female children. And being a woman, I was able to go back in the tents. This is in Mexico. And that giraffe's name is, is Madonna. That's in Oaxaca where I teach. And then I went to Vietnam I, on one of those projects, Day in the Life projects, and shot in four by five. And that's in New York, that's Anna Mae. And I had to bribe her to, be, to photograph her. I had to bring a whole crate of, of donuts for her. <laughs> this is early photograph taken in, in the 60s, in Acadian wedding. And this is Jeanette. I, I met her, this was taken in the, in the 70s. I met her in Central Park and then followed her for a summer. She was just the youngest looking pregnant girl I'd ever seen. And I was able to be there for when she went into labor. And then in the 70s, I did mid to late 70s. I did a, a, a series of pictures on a mental, in a mental hospital. I worked on Cuckoo's Nest. And I met the director of the hospital who just recently died actually in, in his late 90s. And um, he, we became friends, and he allowed me to come back. And I was talking to someone, 
how it's, it was easier to get access at that time than now because of the internet now. People sort of realize the power of photography and they realize if you take their picture, the whole world is connected. Everyone is going to see it. That's Lori. She stole our keys. We had a set of keys. We lived in a, war, a deserted ward right off the main ward. Mary Frances. She'd been in the hospital since she was 15. Then I did another story right after this in Miami Beach with uh, the people that a lot of old people were living there then um, in South Beach. And this is Harry Hessel. And he was a, a window washer. And he, I met him. And all he wanted was for me to photograph him nude. And I have to say, I was frightened. He was strong. He, said, he claimed to be 105. I don't believe him. But anyway, so I went to his house to photograph him. I brought someone with me because <laughs> you have to, you know. Anyway. This is a retirement community in, in St. Petersburg, Florida. And this is a, a story I did on gigolos, men that dance with women for money in Florida. And a story for poverty, about poverty. I mean, I used magazines to do my own work. I mean, it, it was, it, they were like grants for me. They were a way for me to produce my own work. This was a, a project assigned by Fortune magazine on poverty, rural and urban poverty in America. And then for a while, I, not anymore, but for a while, um, I was working for the New Yorker doing a, a photograph about New York for them. And this was a project for, a, 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 it's sort of a nonprofit called HELP, which is a, a, a shelter, but it, it's, it's a really wonderful shelter because it, it gives a, a fam, families apartments to live in so they have their privacy. And I, when they asked me to do this, I decided to do it through the eyes of children that lived in a, in a shelter. I love Halloween. <laughs> She's a mermaid. That's in Texas. And one assignment from Life magazine about a mall and, uh, in middle America. And I happened to go there when Mickey and Minnie were there. So people would line up all day just to go and meet with their kids to meet Mickey and Minnie. I was always interested in prom. I photographed many proms, and I would do it first as a documentary photographer in 35 millimeter. Then I went up to two and a quarter, and medium format, uh, six by seven with my Mia Seven. More street work for the New Yorker. This is a club in Las Vegas for celebrity lookalikes. A, a project done for Texas Monthly on small town rodeos in four by five. A project on the death of a child. A project for Life magazine on a leprosy hospital in Carville, Louisiana. A story on a family that lived in a car for Life magazine, the Dam family. And I'm still in touch with them. The woman, the mother, just died. But the two kids, I'm in touch with them. And that's Jesse. I went back, I did the story in 1988. I went back in 1994 and found them. They were squatting in the high desert. And that's Jesse. And that's Nick. I took Nick with me when I left and gave him to a friend of mine in LA. So he had a good life. But uh, and this was probably the hardest picture I ever took and, and, and agreed to publish. That's Chrissy and her boyfriend. That's Jesse when I saw him, when I went up to meet him in the high desert. Unfortunately, Jesse's in prison now because he killed someone, he shot them. And California has very, very strict gun laws, which I guess they should. But we found him a good lawyer, and he, it's the only trouble he's ever been in. So it was a fight, and I don't know why he had a gun, but in any case, in a few years, he'll probably be out. I think he'll have to serve about 12 years. More on poverty in America. That's Amanda and her cousin Amy. It was a story for life on, on problem children. This was sort of when life was just starting to close and the story never ran, but it was a great opportunity for me to take pictures. 
And I, I was always fascinated with twins. Everybody's been uh, fascinated by twins. August Sander, everybody. I mean, twins are so interesting. Two people looking exactly alike. I mean, what could be more strange? But anyway, so I started working with a 20 by 24 Polaroid about 15 years ago, and I really, it's a fantastic camera. And it's kind of the opposite of digital because what you see is, is what you get. And there's no, let's take care of it in post. There's none of that. I mean, what you see, you have to do your lighting as if you're making a print. It's technically extremely challenging, but it's a fantastic camera. And it produces this picture that's like an object. So I thought about twi twins, and I decided to do a project on twins. And, and, and um, that was Carla and Miley, and the doctor said that even their freckles were alike. That's Teresa Merriweather and Tilly Merriweather, and they were twins that took care of twins, hydrocephalic boys. And, and this is Riley and Emily Schultz, and that's Halsey, Kelsey and Heather Dietrich, and they had over 100 Barbie dolls. Unfortunately, I didn't bring them with them. I would have photographed them. And then I did a story for life uh, in, in the 80s called Streetwise. Um, well, the story wasn't called Twitch, right? We made a film called Streetwise, but it was about street kids in Seattle. And that's Rat and Mike with a gun. And it was an incredible assignment. And I went out with a writer, Cheryl McCall, to Seattle, and we photographed kids on the street. And then came back and went back three months later to make a film, which became called Streetwise, and that's tiny. And I've followed her now since, uh, well, for 30, it was 30 years ago, but I followed her for almost the full 30 years. That's her with her mother later. And she has 10 children now. She always wanted 10 children. That's two of her kids. That's tiny. And we're going to do a Kickstarter to try and go out and now make another f film about her, you know, 30 years later with 10 children. And the, the kids range in age from 5 to 27. So it should be really interesting. Life's still a struggle for her, but she's an amazing person. Um, I, I want to go to the next one. How, how do I progress to the next one? Do I just, was it automatically going to go? Oh, prom. Okay, we're going to talk about prom. So I was talking about this, this 20 by 24 camera, which I really, really love. And I was thinking, what else can I do now? I want to do something else with it, because I was using it when I was working for the New Yorker to do portraits. And um, I, I said, what could I do besides twins? What would be interesting? And I thought about prom, because I had been photographing proms. So I did a project where I photographed over four years, 12 proms. And um, it, it, was, it was really difficult to organize because at first I couldn't get any access to any proms because they're kids. And again, the internet, they were afraid, you know, who was I? But after the first year, I was able to get, uh, to get access. And this is at Tottenville High School in New York. Um, this was taken at Palisades High. In, in, uh, this is their prom, and, and that's in California, of course. This is at my high school. I went to my own high school, Cheltenham High School in Philadelphia. Uh, it's, again, my high school. <laughs> uh, 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 we wanted a really fancy high school. The only, um, the only school that turned me down was Sacred Heart. I really wanted Sacred Heart Academy in New York so badly because it's a very fancy private school and it's very traditional. But, but that's the only one that turned me down. So, so we, we decided to go to Harvard Westlake, which is, which is a very fancy school, very good school in Los Angeles. The other schools in New York, prom, they're too kind of cool for prom, so they wear jeans, they don't get dressed up. But, but at, at Harvard Westlake, it's very, California, you know, and Hollywood, and it's a big deal. So, so we got into Harvard Westlake, and that was Harvard Westlake. <laughs> and then this was at another school. This was actually a really interesting school. This is an, another Westlake, but it's in Austin, and very upper middle class kids. Uh, this this was at St. Michael Academy, a, a private private Catholic school in New York, but not a fancy school. <laughs> the nun was very upset. <laughs> um, this is again St. Michael Academy. This is Tottenville again, football players. This is, this is um, 
Actually, we tracked the kids afterwards. This couple broke up. It's very sad. They were a great couple. This is a Tottenville. This is my high school. And right when I was taking this picture, the principal walked in. And I thought, uh-oh, I've had it. You know, because... <laughs> but it was okay. <laughs> this is Tottenville again. Tottenville was great. Very Italian. <laughs> So she's, she's very smart, actually. So he's a hairdresser now. He's a hairstylist. I, I bump into them in New York all the time. And she's going to Columbia Graduate School in Physics or something. So <laughs> this is a Palisades Charter High. And, and this is at Sloan Kettering. Because I, Sloan Kettering has a prom. Sloan Kettering is a cancer hospital in New York, a great hospital. And I've done, I photographed there before, so they let me come to their prom and do this for the book. And that's Ashley and two of her friends. And Ashley's doing fine now. She is. She's beautiful. She's... We made a film at the same time we did this, and, and Ashley was incredible in the film. Uh, this is at uh, Palisades High again. This was this incredible high school. It was just like being in Mexico, exactly. It was a, a MacArthur High School in, in Texas, in Houston. <laughs> St. Michael Academy. This is, this is a high school, the Mexico High School in Houston. Oh, this is a, was a wonderful high school. Malcolm X Shabazz High School in Newark, New Jersey. I love his watch. It's bling. I lost this one. Oh, yeah. This again, uh, this was uh, MacArthur High School, the Mexican high school in Houston. Um, th this was uh, Charlottesville High, high School in, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Ithaca High. Charlottesville again. Charlottesville High. This is um, Fontbonne Hall Prom. It's a private school, Catholic school in New York. Lots of sort of mafiosa daughters there. This is an interesting high school. And again, this is Malcolm X Shabazz. This is Charlottesville High. Uh, and this is the school in Houston. Beautiful kids. They were great. And... This is Westlake High School in Austin, Texas. Okay, the next one, Man and Bees. So I wasn't going to show this, but I'm going to show it really quickly. It's just together, and it's not a really organized PDF, but I'll, I'll do it really quickly. Because this book, I, mean, I always wanted to do a book with the title Man and Beast. Uh, I, do, I photograph animals a lot. And most of the images in this book are about the relationship between man and animals the anthropomorphic quality of animals and the animalistic quality of man. And they're all the pictures taken in India and Mexico. And they're sort of about the similarities, strange similarities of, of the two countries. that Elvin's name was Anarkali. And it's interesting because I, I gave her some bananas after doing this. They're so smart elephants. And then I swear to you, every time I would walk by her after this, she'd go into that pose. <laughs> it's true. They're so smart and so sensitive. And you have to be nice to elephants. The more trainers are killed by elephants than any other animal. Because you hurt their feelings, they'll kill you. <laughs> I went to the, my, I sent my students to the slaughterhouse, but I never had the guts to go in. I never have. I'm, it terrifies me, but they all go, and I look at their pictures, and I think, ugh. But and they've taken some amazing pictures there. So I stayed after once, and I went, and I couldn't go in. I just couldn't do it. But I went around back, so I got a slaughterhouse picture.
That act is called Dr. Elephant. So the last thing I'm going to show you is a photograph of Novartis and then the films. So, you know, just when I thought everything was all over, I had last year the most incredible assignment I've ever had. And it was, it was like one of those once in a million things at times something happens. And it was to, to photograph for a pharmaceutical company called Novartis. And the director of Novartis loves documentary photography. And he hires really good people. I mean, before me, he hired uh, James Knockway and Gene Richards, and he, he loves photography. And so you get to go all over the world to pick your topic. It has to be medical, of course. Cause, and, and so I wanted to do something on, on pediatric medicine, and he agreed. And then Martin, I suggested that Martin make some films, and so Martin made some films, and I'm going to show you this. But I'll just show you what I did very quickly. Um, and I went to Iceland and photographed at, because I did a book on disabled children in Iceland. They have a great program for disability in children in Iceland. It's free. So I went to a summer camp for d disabled kids, a lot with CP or with, with uh, um, syndromes, various syndromes. And I've known these kids because I, I photographed them a couple years before in the school, so a lot of them I knew, which made it a little bit easier for me than just to kind of jump in and, and, and take their picture. This girl is amazing. And some of my students in, in Iceland, I've taken them to her. So she, she loves being photographed. She has severe cerebral palsy. And so every summer, she saves the time for one of my students to come and, and photograph her. She's just amazing. Her name is Sola. But the camp is in a wonderful place, and it's free. They spend two weeks there. And then we went to the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. It was very hard to get access to a hospital because they don't want to show favoritism to one pharmaceutical company. But I know well the director of, of uh, the, uh, the oncology at Children's Hospital in LA, and he's a hematologist and an amazing doctor. So he let us come in there. And we photographed uh, in mainly hematology oncology. And, and that's Yoseline. They, they use this actually on the cover of their annual report, which is very brave for a company. This is a tough picture. She wanted to be a circus performer. Went to India and photographed heart surgery, both catheter and open heart surgery. Wow. 
when I went to Mexico, Martin didn't come because I teach there and I know Oaxaca really well. And so I photographed doctors going out into the field and I photographed a school for Down children, which I know, I know the owner really well because her child has Down syndrome. Went out in the field with these doctors and dentists and the kids in the, in the village performed. And that's, that's Martina. And, you know, they wanted photographs of, you know, how in, older people live in, in Europe and in South America. Older people live with the family, and I know her. And that's her with her family. And that's her grandchild. And that's on the coast. And veterinary medicine. Went to Kenya and photographed malaria. That's actually Burkitt's lymphoma. That's, that's not malaria. Went to Ukraine and photographed eye surgery. Both uh, Odessa and Kiev. Went to China and photographed a big general hospital and a school for autistic children. Now I'm going to show you the films. Do you know how, are you going to put them on? Okay, great. a gift given to me by God. When he was two, he had a fever. Before this fever, he could speak and recognize pictures. But after that, we found his language and intellect degraded. He became silent, wanting to be alone. Gradually, he did not speak at all. Doctors in Guiyang told me it was autism. Our family life became chaotic. In the beginning, we knew nothing about autism and were blindly optimistic 
thinking our son would recover with treatment. It turned out it would be an incurable disease that would last his lifetime. It was then I made up my mind to start a school and create a community of families to help each other. Each school day, there are 11 periods, six in the morning and five in the afternoon. We set our courses based on each child's character and ability. We also provide guidance for the parents. My son is Meng Jingyi. He is like a monkey jumping up and down most of the time. Doctors said he was suffering from autism. It shocked me. I couldn't accept it. I couldn't believe this would happen to my little baby and my family. I even thought about committing suicide until I watched the movie The Ocean Heaven. It started me thinking, if other people can embrace their autistic children, then why couldn't I? If I died, my sweetheart would have roamed about in the street as those wandering cats and dogs. I realized only I could give him a happy life, performing my duties as his mother. On the internet, we found the autism school run by Mrs. Zhao. I sent my baby there. There's been a great change in him. He can understand what people say to him and give responses. Before, he could only say mother, but now he can speak words such as father, aunt, socks. When I used to ask him to walk with me, he did, but there was no eye contact between us. After going to school, he gradually learned some life skills to communicate. It's really helpful. I never considered having a second child. I just want him, because he is my whole world. That's my daughter. Before she was one year and two months old, the doctor had diagnosed her with autism, mental retardation, and congenital cataract. I can describe the feeling of it. I am just an ordinary person. Three diseases. That's too much. It changed my whole life. I found Mrs. Zhao's school. We were lucky. She changed a lot. Before, she did not share affection feelings with her family. Now these feelings grow. My daughter and I are like friends. Sometimes she calls me sister. Sometimes she asks to be the mom. And I am the daughter. We get along with each other very well. She's now in grade one in primary school. She has a friend in school, a little boy. She likes him. The boy told me he couldn't fully understand my daughter's words. I think the situation will change next semester. I think it is a great love from all the teachers and Mrs. Zhao that makes the school great. It's definitely a kind of true love. I feel sorry for devoting much of my time to the school. I'm sure I'm not a good mother. I leave so little to spend with Hao Hao. Our goal is for the children that can to go to normal school even though I know Hao Hao will never be able to go to a normal school. Different people have different lives. This is the best way for him to live his life. And I respect that. I respect life.
to struggle with this blindness. I feel myself like a soldier during the war. He must struggle to win, to win the sight. Every child have the right to sight, to look to the face for the mother, to look for the sun and all beautiful surrounded nature. When I restore the sight of a child, I am happy. It gives me force. It gives me enthusiasm. It gives me love in my speciality because it is a wonderful thing. I have some cases when the parents were the first who say, oh, something wrong with the eyes of my child. The first thing which the mother look very carefully, it is the face of a child. And of course it is eyes. When Dasha was born, she was put in me at once, and uh, she opened her eyes, and I saw that she had a problem. It was seen. Something's wrong with her eyes. Cataract of both eyes, microphthalmia of her left eye, mixed nystagmus, and high level of myopia. She has residual vision of light perception, and now she can see something. And we have operated both eyes and to remove cataract and remove big pieces of glass from both eyes. We were making preparations for the Easter celebration. We built a fire. There were some pieces of glass in the fire. They exploded. His sight was taken away by this moment. He says, don't cry, mom. Everything will be fine. He's getting better. His left eye already can see a little. Today, he had a surgery for his right eye. They were taking his stitches out. It is always so hard to wait. Every time you have to think, do you do it well or no? The procedure, of course, very delicate, and their movements is very little. The size of incision maybe one millimeter or even less than one millimeter. For me to make this procedure, you have to be very quiet, very calm. The surgeon operate 
not by the hands, by the mind. Yaselin is, actually she's different from before she got sick. Now she is very independent. She's feisty. She's always been a girly girl. Always wants to be wearing a dress. When she had her hair, she wanted her hair done. Either a ponytail or braided, but she always wanted to look nice. I dress her and she just go look in the mirror and she'd model, pose just by looking to herself. It's funny because she's so little. And now it's even funnier because she acts like if she has hair, she brushes it. And she just loves to dance and she sings. It's just, just, I don't know, I don't know. She just has something there. Oh my God! <laughs> Yoselin is a very, very special girl. My kiss. Where's How are you, sweetie? Oh, you look so beautiful. She has a rare condition. Are you okay? I'm okay. Okay. That is the bilateral Wilms tumor, and presented to us at a very advanced stage, both with her uh, two kidneys involved by disease, as well as with lung metastasis. Since the beginning, she was very spunky. She had that willingness to fight. We went through therapy, and she was always there with a smile, with a big hug, with a big kiss to me. And that's what makes the day-by-day -day of my life so bearable. You look so beautiful. You doing okay? What happened with your finger? I became a pediatrician because after training in Brazil, and having trained as adult hematologist, I realized that treating kids are much more fun. I got snowman. A snowman? It's going to melt. It's too hot outside. Cancer in, in children is something that we encounter day by day. And what I decided for my life is that my job is to help them get through their journey. And once I realized that I don't decide where the journey ends, that my relationship with the parents, with the children, is just to help them through 
it became easier. It became much simpler for me to be able to deal with the day-by-day challenges because I don't define the end result. I'm here to help them go through the challenges of their day-by-day. Dr. Marcio is a very nice doctor. The first day we got here, we met him. He was actually getting ready to get married. He left whatever he was doing and came to talk to us. This is a carrot. This is a carrot. Now you have a nose. Bye. We were scared, afraid of knowing anything about her sickness. He just comforted us, explained to us step by step the process of her treatment. It is hard because she's our only daughter. The pain of dealing with kids, how hard it is to give a diagnosis to a family, how hard it is to look at a child, a adolescent, a family, and to give the news that you, you or your loved one has cancer. And what hasn't changed is that despite of all our improvement, the pain of giving a diagnosis, the pain of sharing our failures, our inability to cure them, our ability to offer alternative or therapies that will secure long-term outcomes. That pain hasn't changed. And as long as that pain is uh, within me, it's a reason for me to continue to practice and continue to try to help my children and my families. So do we have questions? Any questions? So you have to go to the microphone because otherwise I won't hear you. I have this little device that'll help me, but if I, let's see if I can hear you without the, the, having to use this. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation and sharing the stories. Uh, I'm over here on the right. <laughs> it was uh, it was especially amazing for me to see the images from India because I'm originally from India, and also I've spent quite a bit of time in Mexico as well. So it's just very inspiring to to hear th the stories. The question I have is regarding uh, two questions actually. One is regarding black and white versus color photography, especially you know having worked in India and Mexico. It's just filled with colors, but I have to say your black and white images are absolutely stunning. So what's been your personal experience in terms of black and white versus color? And the second question I have is regarding, you know, how everything is changing from the traditional cameras to now digital cameras. Do you now use digital cameras? And what's, what's been your personal experience as things are changing with cameras and f digital photography and everything else. Thank you so much. Um, well, I, uh, you know, I've always have done some work in color. I mean, I photographed in, in Bombay the brothels in color, and then I photographed street performers in color. But I've always felt that I'm, I'm personally more of a black and white photographer. I'm the first to admit that I think color is much more difficult because you have an added element of color that makes it very hard. And I'm always, you know, what I'm teaching, I'm always looking to see if a student is shooting in color, whether they're really shooting color pictures or whether they're shooting black and white pictures in color. And I think there's a difference. And um, I mean, I, I really admire color photography. I think it's incredibly difficult. It's all difficult, but it's even more difficult. But I think just for myself that I've always, I think, I've seen black and white. And um, the subjects that I've picked seem to work better in black and white. Um, even if I am photographing in Mexico or India, just, just the way I approach them, I approach them more as a black and white photographer. It doesn't mean I don't think color is beautiful and have great admiration for those that are good at it. I, I do. 
But, you know, as far as uh, digital versus analog, most of my students are shooting digitally, and you can make great pictures, uh, you know, uh, digitally. I think it's, it's a different mindset, definitely. I, I still am working analog, although recently I got an, a, a, a monochrome camera, so I'm going to try and learn and see. I mean, I have to see. I, I broke my shoulder this, this summer, so I've had to kind of go light on, on, on but I'm getting, it's much better. So I, I can soon start to get it still in this box to take it out and to see. But, you know, I've, it, it's something new and it's, it's something different, but I think you can make great pictures. I mean, it's all in your eye and in your mind. The one thing that I really don't feel, I, I don't feel that, the cell phone pictures of photography. I, I don't. <laughs> you know. Um, I, I, I have really strong, I, I mean, uh, I think it's visual social media. I think it's completely different. And I, and I think photography is harder than that. I, I think, you know, it takes, it takes time and it, ta it takes years to develop a point of view and a technique. And I have such admiration for so many photographers that have brilliant technique and have a great point of view and I think, you know, picking up a cell phone and, and just taking a picture, it's, it's, it's harder. It doesn't deserve that cred credibility yet. I, I just feel that way. So I've made a new rule when I teach is that, that my students can't take pictures with cell phones. <laughs> they have to use a real camera. I don't care if it's digital or analog. It's about your mind and where your, your mind is, but I think you have to work with it for the moment for the real camera. Another question? Yep, I've got one. Hi. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure to see you. I've been following your work since 74. Um, I got a, a series of books with Paul Filsko, Will McBride, you and um, oh, the other one, Annie Leibovitz, Art Kane. Um, it was a whole series they did. I brought my book with me. I've had it since 74 and hope you'll sign it. My oh. question is, oh. though, that I'm curious about the films. Um, were they shot on film? Were they shot? Yeah, the film is shot digitally. It's shot digitally. I mean, it, I, for, for film work, I mm -hmm. mean, it would have been impossible to get, because Martin has, you know, a whole set of Super 16 equipment and all the lenses and everything. But we worked with very light equipment when we did this project. I mean, I worked with, with Mamiya 7 and my Leicas. That was what I worked with. and and. He, I started out with the Hasselblad also, but then it was just too much equipment to carry. And he worked with, you know, one, we each had one assistant. And it just would have been impossible to have a ton of, of 16 millimeter equipment. It was just too difficult and expensive and complicated. True. Digitally filmed, he worked with, with a Sony um, high definition okay. digital camera. But um, I think for film, it, it, it's great. What you, can, you can make a film. You can actually afford to make a film. Expense-wise, I think film and digital aren't so different because if you're working professionally, you know, commercially or whatever, you have to have a tech with you and everything for digital. It's just as expensive. And, you know, printing is just as expensive. There's, in still pictures, there's not that big a difference, but in film, there's a huge difference yes, in it expense. Is. Well, they've certainly but he still loves film. He loves film. You I don't blame him. him. Oh, they're certainly lovely and very moving films. This side of the room job. is harder for me to hear from. I don't notice him. Well, maybe I'll use this for this side of the room. I'm off to your uh, left. Okay. I'm off to your left over Let's here. Let's see if I can hear in this side of the room. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll tip my cap, in fact. Oh, you're off back to your left. That's here we are. I don't know why. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. I'll, I'll, I'll second the compliments of your films. I, I started out as a filmmaker and the 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 clarity and, and simplicity, the, the cutting away of all the unnecessary stuff uh, in the films I thought was wonderful. I did find myself asking a question during your prom photos, and I wanted to ask you how you made the decision to shoot or to, to publish, print, and show some of the couples closer and some of them really deep, farther away into the room. How, how the decision was made between like the, the closer up stuff and was it just where they stood, or because well, I know you're working with big equipment? It was equipment, really or? important to vary the scale in the photographs. You know, at, for, it was one project that it was going to be a book or a show, both, and I wanted to vary the scale because in working with a big 20 by 24 camera, everything can can look the same. You can get caught in that. So I, I wanted definitely to vary the scale. So I had to make a decision 
about whether I, well, the distance I wanted to be from the couples. And I had to make that quickly because you don't, first of all, especially with the prom, you didn't, you had a limited time where you could work with people. You know, you're taking their prom away from them. And, and, and also the film is so expensive. It, it's $200 a sheet, one sheet. So you, you can't like try this, 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 and you have to, you have to really make a decision. So, so you moved I the camera, you didn't decision. move, they didn't move, you moved the camera. Yeah, no, because it, had to, it was lit. It's very, it's very lit. I mean, we had sometimes 16 strobes. We had, not sometimes, we had 16 strobes. It's very lit because you're shooting with a, you're shooting with, with a lens, it's an 800 millimeter lens and at, at F64, F, F64. So you need a lot of light, you know. And we wanted depth of field. I, I didn't want to have to be so careful that everything wanted it to be sharp enough that, that they could move a bit if they wanted to. Thank so, you. So I needed a lot of light. And I wanted it to be lit. I didn't want it just to be splash light on it. So it's almost lit like cinema in the sense there's a lot of nets and flags and it's carefully lit. It's marked where, where, they, where they can stand. But so yeah, the camera moved. Miss Mark, uh, thank you for being here. No, I gotta put these up. Yeah, I can't hear my the voice really bad. Yeah. Um, thank you for being here. You know, given your longevity in the business, I watched your career for a long time. You've done mainly editorial, amazing work. Can you, uh, can you hear me okay? Ask me the question again. I'm sorry. That uh, I think given the longevity in the business, you've done mainly magazine and editorial work, a very little to no crass advertising, which is great to see. The uh, Novartis stuff was so really... Uh, longevity to... Well, your career. My, my career? Well, I'm yes. old, that's all. <laughs> 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 I've been shooting a long time. Right. Uh, I've, <laughs> Thank you. For you for a long time. But my question is this given the dearth or demise of many media outlets along with the democratization of photography via camera phones and what what have you, what would you uh, say is the future? You have to rephrase that because I'm confused. Sir. Given what's happened in the photographic world, right? What well, are we gonna do? Yeah, exactly. Okay, Thank you. It. Okay. No. Well, you know, it's a major problem. I mean, basically, I'm teaching. I teach, and I, I sell my work, and I, I want to photograph. I still love taking pictures, and I want to photograph, but um, I'm not working for magazines anymore. I haven't had a magazine call me in, in almost a year. Surprising, isn't it? Well, it's because I don't walk around with it in Instagram. You know, it's true. It's because I, no, no. And it's because they want very heavily photoshopped a certain style. They want a certain style. So, I mean, it's, it's not only me. I think it's a lot of people you don't see anymore because they all want the quick fix and they want an illustration. I know. They want an illustration. I'm not an illustrator. And, and magazines, that's, you know, they kind of follow each other like sheep. It's, it's true. And they want illustrations. And so basically what you're seeing in, in magazines are illustrations that are very heavily... I have nothing against Photoshop. When it's used as a darkroom, it's great. And it can, you know, print, beautiful prints can be made. But it's not really used as a darkroom. It's used as a... And often the photographer doesn't even do the post-production. It's done but with somebody else who's actually doing the real work. And that's just not what I do. I mean, I'm, I, I'm kind of a purist that loves reality. And that's not the trend now. They don't, that's not what they want. They want, you know, very commercial, very commercial, very decorated illustrations. And, and uh, so basically um, what I'm going to do, I mean, Martin and I are, going to, are trying to get funding. I'm going to work more with Tiny in, in Seattle. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let a bunch of like art directors make me stop photographing. It's ridiculous. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think that you just have to, you know, you just have to stay with it. And I, and I believe in it. And the 
photographers whose work I love the most are the photographers that do real work, you know, that are in a way purists and, and that take real pictures and that believe in content. I think the most important thing in a photograph is its content. You know, not its, its, its you know, flashy decorative divisiveness. That's not interesting to me. I'd rather see that in a real illustrator, a drawing. I think it does it better. So, I mean, I just, so I won't work for magazines, you know. Basically, that, that's just that's the way it is, you know. But I think you have to go on with your work, you know. <laughs> you know, I feel very lucky in a way because I did have the best of it. You know, I, I was able to, to really do, you know, and I felt that when I read the piece from 1991, the Smithsonian book, you know, I was talking about I was going to India for three months. It's when I was working on, on the this, this circuses. And then I was going to come back and do this work for Life magazine. And it, there was never a question that you, when you were doing a story, you were, the big thing was reality, that you weren't allowed to change anything in, in an image. It was because now it's all about changing everything. And that's just not what I do. I mean, it's fine, it, you know, it's an illustration. But I'm a photographer. So way it is. Mary Ellen? Yes. Yes. Um, we had the opportunity to work together in the, before you went to Seattle, when you came and you did a shoot at Gallaudet. Oh, I remember that. Yes, long but. time ago. <laughs> so, that was but a long I, time ago. I think what you're talking about, and I'd like to hear more about it, is the story that goes with the photography. The point of view. When you're talking with your students about point of view, um, you know, as I've evolved over time, all my work now has to do with three things, race, class, and culture. And that's the point of view, that's the lens that I look at the world through. How do you work with your students now on helping them get over their cell phone photographs Instant photographs. You're not allowed to take them. Like, yeah, but how do you? Yeah, how no, do you help them develop that that durée, that point of view? Well, I mean, I first of all, I think it's important to, to for them to work on their own. Like I never believed in them going, you know, in a group when you teach in a group and everyone taking pictures over everyone's shoulder. So they have to work as individuals on their own project. Even if they go to an event that's happening in, in, in Oaxaca or in Reykjavik or wherever. Um, and, uh, you know, when I'm teaching for like, it's, I mean, I don't teach over long periods of time. It's like a 10-day workshop in, in Oaxaca. I look at their work every day and I try and see the direction they're going in. And, and by looking at their contact sheets or... With, with digital, it's not. I'm looking on a computer. I have them cut it down to the equivalent of, let's say, five or six rolls a day. And I'm looking at, at, at what they've shot. And I try to sh show them what, how they see things well and how they don't see things well and how to be able to trans... I mean, the camera's a machine that you operate in a way to translate what you're thinking. It's more like writing photography in a way, what you're thinking. And... and um, and in a way, there's nothing accidental about it. It has to be deliberate. You're shooting something for a reason. You're going after something for a reason. It's not accidental. I don't think it's accidental. And I guess that's what I feel with the cell phone. Accidentally, you can make a really pretty picture, easily. Whereas with a camera, you have to really think about your decision more, about why you're shooting something. I ask them a lot, why'd you shoot that? And, and you know, slowly, and I mean, the work they've, they've done is really great and some people that I've worked with over the years they've really turned into wonderful photographers they have by just thinking and having the, the the courage to be able to have a point of view and an opinion about something it's very important That's, I remember that story in Gallaudet that was such a hard assignment I've never felt more isolated in my life you know being a hearing person among people that can hear because it was such a closed society and I really felt like an outsider. It was interesting. It was a, also it's very difficult to photograph. It's easy to photograph people that are blind because it's very visual being blind. It's very difficult to photograph people that cannot hear because 
how do you show that with your camera? It's, it's, you could film it if you're making a film, but to show it in a still picture is extremely difficult. It was a, it was a very challenging assignment. The girl was beautiful. I remember her. She was beautiful. That helped because she was so incredible looking. But, but it, was, it was difficult. Yeah, and she, was, and she was a dance student. She was a dancer. And she had a boyfriend, a lovely boyfriend. And remember that? It was like, they broke see? up. They were, <laughs> why? They broke up. It was a great assignment. But there were so many assignments like that that were just great and really challenged you. So for young people today, I think it's really hard. They have to make their own assignments. And they, they can't be discouraged by, you know, because it's not trendy to, to, to be interested in reality and, and instead of decoration. And it's, it's not trendy to have a strong point of view and to make images that are, that are powerful with content. You, you can't, you know, you, you have to fight for what you believe in and stick to what you believe in. Yeah, I've always felt that. You know, I guess I'm known to be like a tough cookie, but I'm not really. But I've always feel that, that you, you have to fight for what you believe in. You know, if you want to do anything worthwhile, you, you have to do that. And, and didn't Mother Teresa have you um, work and contribute to the mission before you could do the photographs? Well, it wasn't her. It was, it was um, Sister Luke who ran the Home for the Dying. I had to, you know, help. Mother Teresa made me sit under the stairs to, to learn humility. <laughs> she punished me. She was stricter, more strict, more strict. Sister Luke was, ran the Home for the Dying and no, I think that, yeah, I mean, I don't think you necessarily have to do that, though. I think that you're, you're there as a photographer, and that's what you do. But it was, it was interesting to do that. I do believe in going back, though. You're going, you go back to a place again and again, and the people know you. And, and you, you have access because of that, you know, a certain access. Although it's harder today than it, than it was uh, because of the Internet. Yeah. I'm not sure I would, if I w went on Falkland Road today whether I would be able to have access because of the internet. Thank you. Thanks. And that actually leads into my question perfectly. Uh, I'm curious, if you see someone you want to photograph or a situation you want to photograph, how do you always approach it the same way? Do you have a similar way of getting in to people or do you always vary it based on the situation? Well, now I'm in this period where I really don't like people looking at the camera. I'm re when I go out on the street, I really don't want them looking at seeing me. You know, I really like it want to, to be able to be a fly on the wall. So I try and catch things. I'm trying more and more to do that. Um, but they, let's say if, if, I, if they see me or whatever, I might say to them, you know, I'm a photographer. Uh, can, uh, do you mind if I take your picture? And it was easier before because they'd say, oh, so who do you work for? And then I could say, oh, I'm for working for the New Yorker, or I'm working for Life, or whatever. So now I can say, well, I'm just a photographer. You know, I'm just, you know. But um, I, I think there's nothing wrong with asking. And if people say no, I never, I never push it. But, you know, usually they don't say no. It depends. You know, you have to, everything just different. And you kind of... You, you sort of feel the situation from, you know, in, 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 when I go on the street, it's usually a, around an event, so, but not the event itself. It's like the sidelines of the event. And people are there and they know they're going to be photographed, so usually it's okay. But and, and how often? Ask. There's nothing wrong with asking, or I'd like not to be seen now. So you've had these long relationships with some of your subjects. Do you feel like that's still possible? Of course. Okay. Like that you still do that. You're still yeah, looking for me. Yeah, I do that. I mean, that's why we hoped we were going to go out and photograph Tiny again, because we know her. And they're, they're waiting for us. I was going to go this summer, except for my arm. But no, no, I, that's how I work in a way. I like to do that because they know me and I feel more comfortable. Although often I find it harder to photograph someone I know than someone I don't know. But with her, it's, if, if you have a photographic relationship with someone and you go back to them, that's different. Thank you. Uh, Mary Ellen, I think that's it for questions. Um, Kave, if you have any last uh, comments, we want to thank you very much for the presentation. It was wonderful. Absolutely terrific.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to also take a minute to thank our past presidents. Uh, a few of them are here. They really showed us a lot going forward. Um, uh, Paul and Irene and Rick and Hanale, thank you so much for everything you've done through the years for ASMPDC. And if I've missed anybody, um, thanks again to our board, Theo. And the audiovisual guy, he was great. Absolutely. Thanks for the, to the Smithsonian. He was fantastic. And Photo Week is still going on for quite a few days, right, Theo? Anything they should know? Come on down, join. Have fun. And uh, there's a book signing uh, with Mary Ellen. She's uh, graciously um, agreed to sign your books. Thank you so much. I'll just get my stuff together. Is this my turn? This is my turn.